Welcome to Lessons for Living. I'm Bill Santos. Thank you so much for watching. Charles Robertson should have just turned himself in. Well, not that he would have been acquitted. After all, he did rob a bank. But at least he would probably have stayed out of the headlines. We most definitely would not be talking about him today. And he certainly would not have become the laughing stock of Virginia Beach, Virginia. Robertson, cash strapped, 19 years old, went to the Jefferson State Bank on a Wednesday afternoon and filled out a loan application and left. Well, apparently he changed his mind about the loan and opted for a quicker plan. He returned within a couple of hours with a pistol, a bag, and a note demanding money. The teller complied, and all of a sudden, Robertson is holding a bag of loot. Now, figuring the police were fast on their way, he dashed out the front door. He was halfway to the car when he realized that he had left the note at the bank. Well, fearing it could be used as evidence against him, he ran back into the bank and snatched the note from the teller. Now, holding the note and the money, he ran a block to where he had parked his car. That's when he realized he had left his keys on the bank counter when he went back for the note. At this point, the detective telling the story said, total panic set in. Robertson ducked into a restroom of a fast food restaurant. He dislodged a ceiling tile and he hid the money and his 25 caliber handgun. Scampering through the alleys and creeping behind cars, he finally reached his apartment where his roommate, who knew nothing of the robbery, greeted him with the words, hey Chuck, I need my car. You see, Robertson's getaway car was a loner. Well, rather than confess to the crime and admit the mess that he was in, Robertson shoveled another spade of dirt deeper into the hole. Oh, uh, yeah, your car. It was stolen, he lied. While Robertson watched in panic, the roommate calls the police to inform them that his car has been stolen. About 20 minutes later, an officer spotted the stolen car a block from the recently robbed bank. Well, word was already out that the robber had forgotten his keys. The officer put two and two together, tried the keys in the car, and they worked. Well, detectives went to the address of the person who had reported the missing car, and there they found Robertson. He confessed, was charged with robbery, and was put in jail. Well, some days it seems that nothing goes right. I mean, we've all been there. Charles Robertson is not alone. Now, I've never robbed a bank or taken money. But we've all taken advantage or taken control or taken leave of our senses. And then, like Charles Robertson, we've all taken off, dashing down alleys of deceit. Though we try to act normal, everyone who looks closely at us, they can tell that Things are not right. Our eyes are darting. Our hands are fidgeting. We chatter nervously. Committed to the cover-up, we scream and we squirm, and we don't want anyone to know the truth, especially God. Interestingly enough, a 2012 study published in the Journal of Experimental Psychology found that secret keeping exacted a physical toll on subjects increasing the effort needed to perform tasks. You see, right from the beginning of the Bible, God has called for honesty. He's never demanded perfection, but he has expected truthfulness. As far back as in the days of Moses, God said in Leviticus chapter 26, beginning at verse 40, but if they confess their iniquity, and the iniquity of their fathers with their treachery that they have committed against me, and also that they have walked contrary to me 
and that I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land. David's sinful deed was done. The growing baby in his pregnant bride was a mute reminder of that fateful spring night when adultery stained the king's record. Not only adultery, but hypocrisy, deception, and murder, and a cowardly cover-up. For about one year, David lived in misery. He conducted all the same affairs of the state as before, met with the same people, kept the same schedule. On the outside, nothing seemed to have changed. Yet on the inside, everything changed. The memory of his sin haunted David day and night. In fact, in the 51st Psalm, uh, verse 3, he wrote, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. The guilt was taking a toll on David physically. His health began to deteriorate. In Psalm 32 verses 3 and 4, he writes this, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long for day and night, thy hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of the summer. Got lingering anger, stress, high blood pressure? Well, you may need to forgive someone or to be forgiven yourself. That was the conclusion of an increasing number of social scientists. You see, religion has long held that forgiveness is an important component of a fruitful life. Now, a recent Christianity Today article outlined secular research that also supports its personal and societal benefits. 30 years ago, Kansas psychologist Dr. Glenn Mack Harden searched in vain to find studies on forgiveness in the academic digest psychological abstracts. Today, there exists an international forgiveness institute and a $10 million campaign for forgiveness research. Uh, Jimmy Carter and Desmond Tutu were found amongst the leaders of this organization. The John Templeton Foundation has awarded many grants in this field. Hardin says on forgiveness, it releases the offender from prolonged anger, rage, and stress that have been linked to physiological problems such as cardiovascular diseases, high blood pressure, hypertension, cancer, and other psychosomatic illnesses. You see, daily life brings with it many sources of conflict. Spouses, parents, children, employers, former employers, bullies, enemies, racial and ethnic bigots. If offense leads to resentment, and resentment then grows to bitterness, then anger and explosion of violence can result. If parties, however, forgive each other, then healing and reconciliation and restoration can follow. In the popular ABC television series, Revenge, Emily Thorne comes to the Hamptons renting a house next to the Grayson family to enjoy a bright summer. However, it's revealed that Emily has been to the Hamptons before as a little girl. In reality, Emily is actually Amanda Clark, whose father was framed for a crime he did not commit and sent to prison for life. She was permanently separated from him and never saw him again. Now, she is returned to the Hamptons intent on getting revenge against those who wronged her and her father. But the further she goes, the more her emotions get involved and the more she questions her motives and the moves that she makes. Good Morning America featured a special report entitled Forgiveness Reduces Stress. In that report, they cited a study at Hope College in Holland, Michigan, 
where researchers asked 71 college students to recall a hurtful situation that involved another person. And in the study, which appears in Psychological Science, the students were asked to assess how their bodies reacted as they spent two hours alternately imagining themselves forgiving and not forgiving the other person. Each session lasted about 16 seconds, followed by a relaxation period. Now, during the unforgiveness sessions, they replayed the events in their minds, remembering how unfair it was of that person to hurt them and, and how they would like them to feel about it and how they would feel if they harbored a grudge. The students' heart rates jumped from a baseline of 1.75 beats every four seconds to nearly three beats during the rehearsal sessions. The beats rose 2.6 when they harbored grudges. Similarly, blood pressure also rose in that four second period when the students either rehearsed the hurtful experience or harbored grudges. But when the students chose to empathize with the person who hurt them and focus on their human qualities, their heart rate fell an average of half a beat every four seconds. Now, in David's situation, despite the suffering he was going through physically and emotionally, he refused to confess his sin until something happened. In 2 Samuel, in, in the 12th chapter, God penetrated David's defenses through a bold confrontation of the prophet Nathan. God waited until just the right time after Bathsheba's baby had been born and David's suffering had softened his heart some. The prophet Nathan, a wise man, he didn't charge in with accusations. God wanted David restored and not shot down. So Nathan comes with a story, a parable that God had given him to touch David's heart. 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Well, the story hit home for David, you see, for he too had been a poor shepherd who loved his sheep. It also unleashed emotions that he had bound and gagged in his efforts to live with his guilt. Nathan knew that the parable had worked when in verses 5 and 6, David explodes with rage. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die, and he must make restitution for the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and had no compassion. Now the standard for restitution had been established there in Exodus 22. Five oxen for every ox killed, and four sheep for each sheep. David felt that this punishment was still too lenient for the rich man. His cold indifference, the fact that he had so many lambs to choose from and took the only one belonging to the poor man, for this David felt that that rich man should die. Nathan quickly replied with words that penetrated David's heart like a sharp-edged sword. You are the man. David listened in silence as, as Nathan exposed the details of David's sin as revealed to him by God. Verse 7, Nathan then said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, 
It is I who anointed you king over Israel. It is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. If that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed with the sword one of the sons of Ammon. Now, listening to these words must have caused David a great deal of pain. But at least it's now out in the open. No more concealing of his sin and having it fester inside of him. No more pretending like everything was all right. David he must have sent, felt like a sense of relief. But there would be other consequences. Verse 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Then says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion and he shall lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. The rules of restitution were enacted against David. In the book, Prophets and Kings, we read, the prophet's rebuke touched the heart of David. Conscience was aroused. His guilt appeared in all its enormity. His soul was bowed in penitence before God. With trembling lips, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. All wrong done to others reaches back from the injured one to God. David had committed a grievous sin toward both Uriah and Bathsheba, and he keenly felt this, but infinitely greater was his sin against God. I have sinned against the Lord. David's words are few. He presents no excuse, no pleading because of human weakness. He openly acknowledges his sin. David had used Bathsheba. He had betrayed Uriah, shamed his family, disgraced the nation, but he had also sinned against the Lord there would be found none in Israel to execute the sentence of death upon the anointed of the Lord. David trembled, lest guilty and unforgiven, he should be cut down by the swift judgment of God. But the message was sent to him by the prophet, verse 13. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has taken away your sins, you shall not die. Yet, God's justice must be maintained. The sentence of death was transferred from David to the child of his sin, so the Lord's enemies would have no reason to blaspheme. The king was given opportunity for repentance, while to him the suffering and death of his child as part of his punishment was far more bitter than his own death ever would have been. The prophet says in verse 14, However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. When this child was stricken, David with fasting and deep humiliation pleaded for its life. He put off his royal robes, he laid aside his crown, and night after night he lay upon the earth in heartbroken grief, interceding for the innocent one, suffering for his guilt. Verse 17 says, And the elders of his household stood beside him in order to raise him up from the ground, but he was unwilling and would not eat food with them. Often when judgments have been pronounced upon persons or cities, humiliation and repentance have turned aside the punishment. Encouraged by this thought, David persevered in his prayers so long as the child was spared. Upon learning that his son was dead, he quietly submitted to the decree of God. The first stroke had fallen of that retribution 
which David himself had declared just. But David, trusting in God's mercy, was not without comfort. You see, many, having learned the story of David's fall, have quietly inquired, why was this made public? Why did God see fit to throw open to the world this dark passage in the life of David? You see, this passage in David's history is full of significance to us. It is one of the most forceful illustrations given of us as, as to the struggles and the temptations we all face and of genuine repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. Through the ages, this story has proved a source of encouragement to many that having made a mistake were really struggling under the burden of their guilt. Thousands who have slipped when on the verge of despair have remembered how David's sincere repentance and confession were accepted by God, notwithstanding the fact that he suffered for his transgression. And they have also taken courage to repent and to try once again to walk in the way of God's leading. This is not you. It happens all the time. Listen, if you loan me your car and I smash it up, how much am I looking forward to seeing you again, right? It's no coincidence that the result of the first sin was to duck into the bushes. Adam and Eve ate the fruit. They hear God in the garden and they jump behind the bushes. Where are you, God asked. Not for his benefit. He knew exactly where they were. The question was not a spiritual, it was spiritual. It wasn't a geographical question. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 7 says, the wicked needs to abandon their lifestyle and sinful people their plans. They should return to the Lord and he will show mercy to them and to their God for he will forgive them. We know when God is looking for us. Our heart tells us, our Bible tells us, the mirror tells us. The longer we run, the more complicated life gets. But the sooner we confess, the lighter our load becomes. David knew that when he wrote in the 32nd Psalm, when I refused to confess my sin, my whole body wasted away while I groaned in pain all day long. For day and night you tormented me. You tried to destroy me in the intense heat of summer. Then I confessed my sin. I no longer covered up my wrongdoing. I said, I will confess my rebellious acts to the Lord. And then you forgave my sins. May I be so bold right now as to ask you a very direct question. Are you keeping secrets from God? Any parts of your life off limits to God? Learn a lesson from Charles Robertson, the robber. The longer you run, the worse it gets. Learn a lesson from David. The sooner you speak to Jesus, the more you will speak for Jesus. Trust me, you will feel better if you get it out. Once you're in the grip of get grace, you are free to be honest. Turn yourself in before things get worse. You will be glad you did. Honest to God, you will. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the assurance that when we bring our sins to you in humble confession, that you forgive and forget them. We come before you now land our lives at your feet. We confess our sins to you. Forgive us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've come to the end of another program. I want to thank you for joining us. 
Want to remind you before we go of a couple of things. Our website, l4ltv.com. On the website, you can watch any of the previous programs. Um, you can uh, request the Bible studies. I hope you take advantage of the Bible studies we're offering. Uh, those can be done, uh, like I said, on, by correspondence. They can be done uh, online. But we can even start a f small Bible study group if you're interested. You can uh, contact us via the website, or if you prefer to speak to one of our volunteers, you dial the 1-800 number. I just ask that you be patient uh, because there may be other folks calling at the same time. So just hang in there, and one of our volunteers will get to you, and they, all they need from you is your name, your address, your email address. No obligation whatsoever on your part. We're not going to ask you to pay for anything. If you want to share with them a uh, prayer request, you can do that also. And we have prayer warriors all around the country that will pray for you. Remember to visit our Facebook page. Like us on Facebook. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, at Santos underscore Bill. Uh, we hope you're enjoying uh, these programs. They are made available through the generosity of many people that have contributed. If uh, ever you feel so moved by the Holy Spirit to also contribute uh, to allow these programs to stay on the air, you can contact us uh, through the website and just let us know. Listen, I'd like to help, um, and we'll get back to you as to how we can do that. Well, our prayer is that we will have the opportunity to be back again with you real soon. And I hope you will be there also. May God bless you, and we'll see you back here real soon.